Good evening. I am Valerie Ashby, Dean of Trinity College of Arts and Sciences here at Duke University. I am delighted to welcome you this evening to the Ambassador Dave and Kay Phillips Family International Lectureship Fall 2018 Discussion. The title this evening is The U.S. Military in a Time of Geopolitical Strain, a conversation with General Joseph F. Dunford, Jr., Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, coordinated by the Duke University Program in American Grand Strategy. We are grateful to the Phillips family for their generous support of the lecture series, the American Grand Strategy Program and Duke University. The Phillips Family International Lecture Series provides the Duke community with an invaluable opportunity for informed discussions led by some of our nation's leading policy minds from both sides of the aisle. Past lectures have focused on, most of, on some of the most salient issues of diplomacy, foreign policy, and national security through discussions with leaders, including Ambassador Nikki Haley, General David Petraeus, Mitt Romney and Condoleezza Rice. Now I would like to introduce you to Peter Fever. Dr. Fever is a professor of political science and public policy at Duke University. He created and directs the American Grand Strategy Program, AGS, and directs the Triangle Institute for Security Studies. AGS seeks to prepare the next generation of strategists by studying past generations and interacting with current strategic leaders. The program works to fulfill its mission, not only through discussions with leaders like tonight's guest, General Dunford, but also through courses, seminars, and active learning opportunities, such as trips to military bases and international staff rides. The program looks forward to heading to Morocco this spring to study Operation Torch the Allied Invasion of French North America in November 1942. Our guest this evening, General Joseph F. Dunford Jr. is the 19th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the nation's highest ranking military officer and the principal military advisor to the President, the Secretary of Defense and the National Security Council. Prior to becoming Chairman on October 1, 2015, General Dumford served as the 36th Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. From 2010 to 2012, he served as the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, and from February 2013 to August 2014, he served as Commander, International Security Assistance Force and United States Forces Afghanistan. Please join me in welcoming General Dunford. We look forward to this evening's discussion. Welcome. Coming. Thank you, General Dunford, for coming. It's, uh, I always am nervous when I'm scheduling someone a senior like you we, because world events intervene, and I was halfway worried last week that we would lose you to the caravan crisis. And I might want to begin there by asking you to talk a little bit about your role in that and uh, why you were still able to come uh, today. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> uh, we're going to... We we're going to start off easy and, 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 and talk about the caravan. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, it's good to be here. And, uh, and the professor was alluding to, I, I did commit to come down uh, last April, and uh, world events uh, kind of interrupted my plans. And so I was committed. Uh, it, would have been, it would have had to have been something very significant for me not to, not to be here tonight. So I, I appreciate the chance. And, and seeing so many uh, people in uniform here, I'm also mindful of the fact that Duke has... Uh, made a pretty significant contribution to the development of our leadership, including my predecessor, who's a, who's a proud blue devil. So uh, well, back to the, uh, to the caravan. So the, the first question is, uh, you know, current events. And uh, much has been in the news and much has been in the paper. Let me explain to you from a military perspective what is actually happening. First of all, the Department of Homeland Security and specifically Customs and Border Police have the mission of dealing with uh, the caravan when it gets to the United States. We were tasked to provide support to the Department of Homeland Security. And the way that works is Department of Homeland Security in writing told us these are the things that we need and it's in the form of logistical support. So you'll see some soldiers down there right now that are putting up concentrina wire and reinforcing the points of entry. 
uh, movement. So we're providing both trucks and helicopter support and, uh, and then also some medical support. Uh, there, are, there is no uh, plan for U.S. military forces to be involved in the actual mission of denying people entry to the United States. There is no plan for, the, for soldiers to come in contact with immigrants or to reinforce Department of Homeland Security as they are conducting their mission. We are providing enabling capabilities. So many people have had, uh, in fact, there's been several articles that have said either the Secretary of Defense or I uh, should speak up about this, and in some cases have either, even suggested that uh, we would resign. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about civil military relations. But the President gave us a legal order, support the Department of Homeland Security. When that comes to me as a military leader, I ask a couple of questions. You know, one is, uh, do we have unambiguous direction as to what the soldiers, in this case, majority of them, have to do? And the answer is yes, I, I understand very clearly uh, what they have to do, and they understand what they have to do. Number two, is it legal? And yes, it is legal. And number three is, do they have the capability, the wherewithal, to perform the task that we've asked them to accomplish? And the answer is yes in all three cases. So, uh, you know, again, this, despite the noise uh, in the media right now for all the reasons that we know, uh, I would just tell you that the soldiers that are down there on the border right now know exactly what they're doing, they know why they're doing it, and they have the proper training and the proper equipment to do it. And that's the responsibility I have as a military leader. So you mentioned the noise. Some of that noise was generated quite surprisingly, perhaps, uh, by your predecessor, General Dempsey, who tweeted out um, uh, what looked like a criticism of the decision, not your decision, but of the higher-up decision. And I was just wondering, uh, I think that's his first time really opining on a policy during the, the while it's still in the news cycle. Yeah. Well, let me not in public specifically address my good friend General Dempsey, because he is a good friend and has been for many years. But there's been a number of uh, three and four stars uh, who have publicly said that, and they've used the word wasteful or inappropriate and so forth. And, uh, and they have the luxury of doing that. They're no longer in uniform. Uh, to be honest with you, I wish they wouldn't do that, but, but they, they certainly can do that if they want to. On the other hand, uh, it's not my job to assess the appropriateness of the mission. It's my job to accept the legality of the mission, and again, the capability of our forces to perform that mission. So uh, others outside the ring can make a subjective assessment as to what, uh, you know, what, what we're doing, but, but I'm not going to comment on that. Well, let's, let's talk about uh, an easy subject then. Let's talk about Russia and China. Um, so part of, part of your... I came down to watch a basketball <laughs> game. This was a, <laughs> so... this was a bait and switch. <laughs> Part of your uh, statutory function is to assess risk and to provide an independent voice advising the president, the secretary of defense, Congress, on the risk that the country faces, particularly those that have a military dimension. And so when you look at the risk uh, facing and threats facing the United States, where do you rank China and Russia in it? And, and how, where do they fit in all of the other risks that are out there? Sure, sure. And let me uh, just touch on what you, what you started with, which is one of my responsibilities is to write the national military strategy. And on even numbered years, we submit that to the Congress. I submit it through the Secretary of Defense. And that's, that's a statutory requirement that I have. When we develop a strategy, just like in any other endeavor, whether it's a commercial, commercial sector or military organization, you, you look for a way to benchmark your organization against the challenges you may face. And when, when I came into this assignment in 2015, as I was preparing and reading, I came across a quote by Henry Kissinger who said that we are in the most complex and volatile period since World War II. And, uh, and then the first weekend I was in the job was the weekend that the Russians went into Syria, uh, Hurricane Joaquin hit, and we had a major civilian casualty incident in Afghanistan. That was the first 72 hours uh, that I was in the job. And so I haven't since then pushed back on, on, uh, on Mr. Kissinger. He, he was exactly right. But when you're in that kind of environment, you have to find some way to make sense of it so that you can plan, so that you can prioritize and allocate resources, so you can assess risk and, uh, and be prepared to respond. And so when we, uh, when we did the assessment in uh, 2015, we looked at China, Russia, Korea, uh, and Iran as the four state actors that pose the greatest challenge, and then the, the steady challenge that we've had now for many years, violent extremism. 
And, uh, and we called that at the time the four plus one, and we, we talked about that. The difference uh, over the last year is that we've kind of reordered it, and this may sound a bit esoteric, but it actually is, is important because it provides the strategic framework within which we prioritize. We shifted from looking at it as four state actors and one non-state actor to two state actors that really represented great power competition, that being China and Russia, and then Iran, North Korea, and violent extremism. And the one thing that I would just say to you is, although we look at those as priorities for planning and priorities for the prioritization and allocation of resources, if there's anything that I have learned in my career, it's, it's humility about our ability to predict the future. So one of the other key aspects of our strategy is not only to benchmark ourselves against those challenges, and our assumption is that if we prepare to deal with one or some combination of those challenges, that we'll have the right inventory of capabilities uh, to deal with the unexpected. But, but, but clearly, as we do our planning, we also think about the unexpected as well as those five challenges. So... Let me just push back on that that claim. It's tr it seems to me that China is a heavy Navy intensive, maybe Air Force, but a Navy intensive uh, challenge. Russia, which threatens uh, on the ground NATO allies, there's a strong army component to that, maybe also Marines. So you, and then of course Iran and, and North Korea are very different entirely. So in, in one sense, if you, which one you prioritize might may shape the force and also consume all the resources. Couldn't sure. confronting China take everything we got? Let me, uh, let me, the other thing in our strategy is, uh, and this is important, when we, uh, when you do, do, do a strategy, you kind of identify your sources of strength. And in our case, we said that our sources of strength were the network of allies and partners that we built up since World War II, and then the United States' ability to project power when and where necessary to advance our, our national interests. And then inside of that, uh, is the ability to move across what we call all domains, and that means sea, air, land, space, and cyberspace. So when we look at Russia and China as an example, uh, if we benchmark the force against those two challenges, and as you identified, they pose unique challenges, but in many ways similar challenges, because the, the thing that is uh, similar to them is they started to study us uh, after 1990, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and then further in 2003. And they were alarmed at our ability to send as much men, material, and equipment as we could in such a short period of time, literally around the world. And so they have spent time over the last 15 or 16 years studying what they perceive to be our vulnerabilities. And there's a term for that. It's called anti-access area denial. In other words, they are looking for ways to disrupt our ability to project power and then to operate freely uh, once we get there. And so what this does is... Uh, when we look at Russia uh, and we look at their ability to, to uh, disrupt our ability to project power to Europe to meet our alliance commitments or to operate freely in Europe, and then we look at the challenge of China, the combination of those two challenges, we believe, will give us the right inventory of capabilities and capacities. So I'm, I'm, I'm having a deja vu experience. I started my professional career in the middle of the 80s when we would talk about the Soviet Union, then Soviet Union, in precisely these terms. But for most of the time at Duke, we've been a post-Cold War era without a hostile peer re rival. Are you saying we're back in a Cold War situation with a hostile peer rival that matches us in the way that the Soviet Union matched us? Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that it's a, it's a Cold War. Uh, but if you think about the 1990s, uh, you remember Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History. And so in the 1990s, the United States had uh, no competitor. And, uh, and, and as we look at Russia and China today, we see Russia and China as peer competitors. It doesn't necessarily equate to a Cold War. Uh, competition doesn't have to be conflict. But we now have two states that actually, and I'll talk specifically from a military perspective, we have two states now that can challenge our ability to project power and challenge us in all five domains. And that's what's different than in the 1990s. So for two decades now, the... American policymakers with China have been saying, if we treat them like an enemy, we're going to make them an enemy. Let's engage them. Let's bring them up in, uh, and let's not fear the rise of China's power. Let's make them a responsible stakeholder, a partner with us. Is that optimistic outcome no longer possible? 
No, I would say diplomatically we should continue to do that, but, but from the military perspective, I can't deal with what China's intent may be. I have to deal with what their capabilities are, and in order for us to have effective deterrence, we have to demonstrate the ability to meet our alliance commitments in the Pacific, and we have five specific treaty allies in the Pacific, and it's, it's, and it's resp our responsibility is to make sure that we can meet those alliance commitments. And we've just come off of a series of exercises, or they might even still be ongoing in, uh, in NATO vis-a-vis um, -vis Russia. Are our NATO allies stepping up to the plate and meeting their uh, what they need to do in order to be effective partners with us? Yeah. I, I, when I came into this job in 2015, uh, we were spending a lot of time assuring our NATO partners uh, of our commitment. And to be honest with you, the, from a capability development perspective, we were years lagging in modernizing NATO to be relevant in NATO terms, to be fit for purpose, to meet the challenges that we can expect to face today. Over the past uh, three years, uh, I think one, we've had a consensus on what the challenges are. Number two, we've had a consensus on what capabilities are necessary to meet those challenges. And what we have seen is a significantly greater investment uh, by the nations in NATO to meet those requirements. You, you hear the 2% a lot, but I would go beyond the 2% and talk about the real capability development that is taking place in NATO right now. We've changed the organizational construct. We've increased the cyber capabilities. Uh, we've increased the transportation assets uh, that allow us to meet our alliance commitments across Europe. So I've seen some significant progress. So one of the functions of the chairman uh, it, that's not widely known is the military-to-military -military diplomatic engagement, that you are in some sense a diplomat, a military diplomat. Uh, do you have much interaction with your counterparts in Russia and China? And if so, how did they react to the national defense strategy, which singled them out, and sure. the national security strategy, which likewise called them out? No, that's a, that's a good question because uh, about 60% of my time is spent engaging with my counterparts. And uh, in the case of Russia, uh, I've met three times with my Russian counterpart uh, since I've been in this assignment. And at various times, I've talked as much as once or twice a month uh, with him, uh, largely to, uh, to minimize the risk of miscalculation and to manage a crisis for a crisis uh, to occur. But we've also worked through the details of issues like Syria and the full range of arms control agreements and so forth. So uh, Russia clearly has a different view on uh, what we're doing. Uh, we generally will agree to disagree when we talk about capability development. I will make it clear that what you're seeing in our posture what you're seeing in the increased forces that we have put in Europe, what you're seeing in the path of capability development we're on is in order to deter a conflict, not to fight, and in order to make sure that we can meet our alliance commitments in NATO. And it is largely reacting to what we have seen over the past 10 years, which is a significant increase in the development of maritime capability. This is Russia now. Maritime capability, modernizing the nuclear enterprise, uh, cyberspace, uh, space capabilities and, uh, and land, land domain. So across all military areas, Russia has made a, a concerted effort over the last 10 years to increase their capabilities. And so I've tried to explain to them that what we are doing is responding to that challenge that they pose. And China? China, uh, I have met with my counterpart uh, one time. Uh, we've done a couple of secure video teleconferences. Uh, I think we made some significant progress in August a year ago. Uh, we have always wanted to have a routine engagement staff to staff with the Chinese in the joint staff. And uh, the Chinese have been reluctant to do that. Last August, they agreed to what we call a joint uh, staff military dialogue. And that's an opportunity for us to tee up a few issues and work through those. Uh, we recently, about four months ago, did a tabletop exercise uh, to talk about a potential crisis uh, as a confidence building measure and, again, to increase transparency and reduce the risk of miscalculation. So China is irritated by what we do. Uh, but again, uh, try to explain to them that, uh, look, uh, there is uh, a rules-based international order, and we talk about a free and, Indo, free and open Indo-Pacific based on international law, norms, and standards. And, uh, and what we are doing uh, in the Pacific is we're flying, operating, and sailing wherever international law allows. And the purpose of that is to demonstrate uh, that we are standing up for those rules. I learned early in my career that if you see something that is not to standard or uh, not within the law and you ignore it, you've set a new standard and it's lower. And so when I talked to my Chinese counterpart, I said, look, this is not a pile of, about a pile of rocks in the Pacific. It's about enforcing international law and a coherent response to your violation of international law. 
But it's also a potential flashpoint. So early on in your tenure, uh, there was some uh, question about how, how aggressive should we be in FONOPS in, in the South China Sea. And reporters, at least, were claiming that the PACOM commander wanted to be you know, leaning more forward. And, and the Obama administration back in Washington was leaning further back. But there's been a lot of uh, sand <laughs> built up since then. And is is this a fait accompli? Is it too late now to to reverse China's uh, actions in the South China Sea? Well, I, th I think what's a uh, more important question is uh, the Indo free and open Indo-Pacific writ large uh, beyond the South China Sea. And I don't think it's too late, but in order, in order for us to have a free and Indo open Indo-Pacific, in order to have China comply with the international law norms and standards as they exist, or seek to change them in a, in a legitimate venue, I think what it's going to take is a coherent collective response, multilateral, not just by the United States. And so one of the things we work on very, very hard is to develop a group of like-minded nations that will seek to have a coherent collective response to violations of international law. And if we, to the extent that we're able to do that, uh, we'll be able to manage, uh, manage the situation in the Pacific peacefully. So let's go down from the, the two down to the, the three. The um, North Korea. We need China to be a, a, a full partner with us in order to achieve the president's goal of, uh, of ending the North Korean nuclear program. That came very close to a, what seemed like a real crisis, uh, at least in the press, last year. It's in a very different place now. Uh, how would you assess the, the threat of North Korea's nuclear program as, it's, as it is now? Sure. First of all, and I think it'd be interesting to just go back uh, to the history of where we started. We had a meeting in February of 2017 uh, when the new administration came in. Secretary Tillerson was the Secretary of State. And uh, the intelligence, so we're, we're at the meeting was the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the Vice President, the remainder of the National Security Council. And the subject was North Korea. You know, most of you remember that in 2016, an unprecedented path of missile development, nuclear development was taking place in North Korea. And when President Obama uh, did the transition with President Trump, he told President Trump that that would be his most significant challenge that he would face. And when the intel community briefed the Secretary of State, they said two things. They said, number one, North Korea will never give up their nuclear weapons because they're inextricably linked to regime survival. And number two, China will never help us to have North Korea give up their nuclear weapons because they value stability on the peninsula more than they fear nuclear weapons. And, uh, and the Secretary of State leaned back and he said, well, then what would you suggest I do? And uh, it, it, fair. And he said, we're going to test those two assumptions. Number one, we're going to put in place uh, an unprecedented framework of international pressure on North Korea through the United Nations. And frankly, what we have seen is exactly that. We've seen UN Security Council resolutions passed with China's and Russia's support, which were unprecedented. And we have also seen, as a result of that pressure, the North Koreans willing to have a conversation. Uh, that dialogue is ongoing. Uh, Secretary Pompeo will meet again uh, with the North Koreans in the, in, the coming, in the coming days, and I don't expect we'll have an immediate solution diplomatically, but we've ceased the testing and the nuclear development. What has not changed is the missile capability that North Korea possesses or the nuclear capability that North Korea possesses. So in the meantime, even as Secretary uh, now Pompeo is working on the diplomatic track, and our job militarily and primarily is to support Secretary Pompeo. And I think just for those of you that might think about things like inter U.S. government interagency and how the State Department interacts with the Department of Defense, there's nothing that we do in the Department of Defense in the Pacific today, uh, or certainly on the peninsula, where we don't have a conversation with Secretary Pompeo, brief him and have a conversation about that. But even as we support Secretary Pompeo with interdicting ship-to-ship -ship transfers of refined petroleum and so forth, the other thing we have is we have 28,500 Americans on a peninsula that are there to deter a provocation or deter aggression against North Korea and to demonstrate that if deterrence fails, we have the capability to respond and meet our alliance commitments to the Republic of Korea. So in the coming months, uh, we'll continue to do that. And, and frankly, uh, the more successful we are in the diplomatic track, the more uncomfortable we will be in the military space. 
because over time, this negotiation will take a form where we're going to have to start making some changes to the military posture on the peninsula. And we're prepared to do that and support of Secretary Pompeo and make sure that we get to the desired end state, which is a peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So help us understand, is it, we're coming on 70 years almost uh, of U.S. troops going to uh, South Korea to defend against North Korea. 70 years later, they're still there. Smaller numbers and not being shot at, but they're still there. In the meantime, North Korea has gone from being more powerful than South Korea to being a tiny fraction of South Korea's economic uh, wealth. So to an American who, who isn't thinking about Korea and says, well, why are we still defending South Korea? What, what, what answer would you give? Well, uh, first, the war is not over. We have an armistice right now. And the United States has a treaty alliance with South Korea. We have, a, we have an alliance that says we will come to South Korea's defense if they're attacked. And, uh, and our posture in the peninsula is in support of that treaty alliance. So we have a, a U.S. has made a commitment to South Korea's security. Okay, let's look, let's look at Iran. Uh, you served one president who had one strategy on Iran. You've then presidents changed, and but you didn't. <laughs> now you serve someone who has a totally different strategy. You had to fully implement Obama's, and now you have to fully implement uh, President Trump's. How how does that work for a military officer who must have his own view of what is the right way to deal with Trump? I mean, uh, to deal with Iran. Sure. Uh, first of all, um, when we look at Iran, we look at five challenges. Uh, we look at a maritime challenge. We look at a cyber challenge. We look at a missile challenge. Uh, we look at a, a, a uh, nuclear challenge. And then we look at the challenge posed by uh, Iranian proxies in the region. Both presidents recognized all five of those challenges. And our military posture is, is designed to deal with those five challenges. The difference between where President uh, Obama was and where President Trump is, President Obama uh, believed that the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was the appropriate way to deal with the Iranian nuclear challenge. And then we would find other ways to deal with those other four challenges. When President Trump came in, he said that he believed that any agreement with Iran that wasn't comprehensive and didn't deal with all five challenges was unacceptable, which is, which is the root of his decision to withdraw from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. But from a military perspective, what we are doing in the maritime space, and that is to deter an interdiction of the Straits of Hormuz, we've been there historically. What we're doing uh, to deal with the Iranian missile threat uh, hasn't changed. What we're doing to deal with the Iranian proxy threat hasn't changed. And, and what has now changed is we're just watching, but there has yet to be seen any further development of Iranian nuclear capability. So from a military posture perspective and from a plans to deal with an Iranian threat, uh, notwithstanding the policy change, it, it won't change our approach until and or unless uh, Iran now begins the path of capability development in the nuclear space. So I bet five years ago you wouldn't have thought we could get this far into the conversation without mentioning the word Afghanistan, but we have. We've made it this far. That by itself tells you something about uh, how much uh, ordinary Americans are thinking about this, our longest war, that we're still fighting and as recently as this past week, uh, suffering casualties in. So talk to us about your vision for how the Afghanistan war will end and sure. and make the case to the American people of why we still need to be there 17 years in. No, it's a great question. I'm actually, uh, I'm glad you asked it uh, so we can talk about it. First of all, I just want to remind everybody, and I think we all remember why we went there is because uh, there was a threat uh, from the region. That's where 9-11 came from. And the assessment of the intelligence community uh, over the last several years has been that if we don't continue to put the kind of pressure that we have put on the threat in that region, it'll reconstitute and attack the homeland. We can all have a debate about that. That is the IC assessment. So that informs uh, a big part of what I'm going to say. But let me, let me just talk to you about where we have been in Afghanistan. From 2001 to 2013, we did the fighting in Afghanistan with some Afghan support, but we were in the lead. In June of 2013, we put the Afghan forces in the lead. Uh, I was in command in Afghanistan at that particular time, and we went from a peak of 140,000 NATO forces to 28,000 in the 20 months that I was in Afghanistan. 
And I can tell you during that particular time, we did not have a proper advisory effort, nor did we have proper enabling capability, that is aviation support, intelligence support, and so forth, for the Afghans, given the challenges that they faced at that particular time and their capabilities. When we redesigned the South Asia strategy in 2017, the first thing we did was say that what we needed to do was go back and look at our advisory effort. And again, uh, there's three phases. We're not doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We went from we were in the lead to we were pulling out uh, with a date certain to, to draw down our forces to in 2017 go to a conditions-based strategy and on the military side tailor our advisory assist effort to make sure we were at the right place in the Afghan formations to make them effective and to make sure that we had sufficient aviation support, sufficient intelligence, and other capabilities to help the Afghans. But this is a campaign that is not going to be won in the military space. So the theory of the case in Afghanistan is that the only way uh, that this is going to end uh, is going to be with an Afghan-owned, Afghan-led reconciliation process. That's the only way the campaign is going to end. And the theory of the South Asia strategy is that with sufficient political pressure, social pressure, religious pressure, and military pressure being a piece of it, then the, then the Taliban will come to the peace table. Can I tell you when? Can I give you a probability of if? No. Uh, what I can tell you is that for the first time, uh, certainly since, since uh, 2001, we now have some legitimate openings uh, with the Taliban. Much of it not in the public space, but I think you know that the president uh, appointed Ambassador Zal Khalilazad to be singularly focused uh, just uh, just on, uh, on reconciliation. And so uh, we believe right now that uh, the Taliban know they cannot win militarily. And just in terms of population control, if you will, uh, the, you know, the Afghan government right now controls about 60 percent of the population. The Taliban control about 11 percent. I'm not trying to make the case for a military outcome uh, in Afghanistan, but I am trying to make the case that the Taliban cannot win militarily. Uh, we believe now that the Taliban recognize that in the case in, in the in the issue now is to find the right political construct to bring them in uh, into a reconciliation process. Positive things that have happened over the past year, one have been the religious fatwas that have come from both Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and Pakistan that have put pressure on the Taliban. Uh, the, uh, the military campaign and the Afghan forces and the successful elections have put some pressure uh, on the Taliban. And, uh, and we've put pressure on, uh, on Pakistan uh, to be more cooperative uh, in supporting reconciliation. And uh, one of the first things that uh, Secretary Pompeo did after Prime Minister Imran Khan was elected was Secretary Pompeo and I personally went uh, to Pakistan. We met with Imran Khan. We met with General Bajwa, who's their chief of the Army staff. We met with their foreign minister to make sure that there was no ambiguity at all in the U.S. position or the U.S. expectations uh, of Pakistan as it pertained to an Afghan-owned, Afghan-led reconciliation process. So. In the coming months, uh, Ambassador Khalilazad will step up uh, on the reconciliation process. He has a number of, uh, you know, kind of developments ongoing right now. I won't even judge whether they're positive or not, but there are developments. And in the meantime, we'll make it clear that we have a conditions-based approach to supporting the Afghan government and uh, in affecting positive or uh, positive political transition with the presidential elections in the spring. Well, we've all seen the headlines: the the cigar, you know, the independent. Um, IG that investigates or assesses the situation in Afghanistan, and they said, uh, I believe, that the Taliban is in the strongest position that it's been in uh, some time. So are we engaging in negotiations with the Taliban from a, weak, a position of weakness uh, comparatively to where we were, say, uh, five years ago? Sure. First of all, I, I don't know uh, why the Taliban would, for the first time, uh, come to the peace table if that they if they if they thought they had a strong hand. I mean, I I I don't think that's the case uh, based on what we're seeing, and uh, and and what the cigar has said uh, is I, I think we were at a stalemate a couple of years ago, and if you look at the changes on the ground, there haven't been significant changes on the ground over the last couple of years. So uh, the cigar has highlighted some uh, some important things, but but here's and I, I'll let somebody else ask a question or have a comment later. Here's, here's the, the framework of the strategic situation. Number one, we believe we have a threat from the region that can affect the homeland and also drive large-scale immigration, which will also present challenges in Europe. So those are the two things, both the uh, manifestation of terrorism 
and large-scale immigration coming out of Afghanistan obviously would be destabilizing. We have uh, vital national interests in South Asia, and that's going to require an enduring diplomatic presence, an enduring economic presence, and an enduring military presence in South Asia. The form of that presence is, is reflected by the conditions on the ground. And although none of us are satisfied that we still have uh, a significant threat from terrorists in the region, none of us are, sati are happy that uh, ISIS has taken root to some degree with some thousands of uh, fighters in, in Afghanistan. The fact is that's where they are. And so our job, my job is not to talk to the president about whether we should stay in Afghanistan or not. It's to talk about how do we get the Afghan security forces to be able to do the preponderance of fighting against the challenge and make sure that our presence in Afghanistan from a military perspective is sustainable over time. And, and one of the things we've done over the past year is get more of our allies to contribute. And we have a thousand more NATO forces uh, today than we did a year ago. And then on the fiscal side, we also have sought increased uh, international development funds uh, from around the world. Uh, Again, there's going to be a political solution to this, which is a reconciliation process, and we're in the process of setting those conditions. Um, is it taking a long time? It, it has. Are insurgencies traditionally uh, long-term events? They are. Where are we uh, relative to where we'll be when this is over? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but we, again, uh, are adjusting our presence over time to make sure it's sustainable because I do think it's going to take some time. Let me ask you about Yemen now. Uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, Jim Mattis said that it's time for that war to wind down, that uh, we've all seen the, the horrible pictures, the humanitarian crisis that some have said is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world today. What influence do we have to bring this uh, war to a close, and what, what uh, responsibility do we have for how it's gone thus far? Yeah, first of all, I mean, uh, you know, what our what our focus is in Yemen is providing whatever support the UN Special Envoy has, Martin Griffiths, to, to bring the bring the parties together and come up with a peaceful resolution. And when you ask about uh, what what I think the word used was leverage or what can we do, um, look, the United Arab Emirates and in, in Saudi Arabia are partners. Uh, we should have influence with them, and uh, we will use uh, that influence. And, uh, and we'll use our good offices to support the, the United Nations effort to, to bring peace. I think you've seen statements by Secretary Pompeo and Secretary Mattis. But I think by the United States leading and being an active participant in the UN peace talks, uh, we can increase the prospects uh, of dealing with what is a very difficult situation. And I wouldn't suggest that a solution is right around the corner. So my last question on this region, and then we'll shift, uh, shift terrain. It's ISIS. Did we declare victory too soon in the war against ISIS? You just said there's a 1,000 uh, in Afghanistan. It feels like we came very close to finally cracking ISIS, and then they reappeared. That's what happened, Al-Qaeda to AQI and, and maybe Al-Qaeda 1.0. Is it? Are we doomed to have uh, the 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0? There's never... A uh, final victory. Well, first, uh, I, I don't. I, I'd push back on the thesis. We declared victory. I, we certainly haven't. I, I certainly haven't. What's a fact is that uh, ISIS holds about two percent of the ground that they held uh, three years ago. They have significantly less resources. The flow of foreign fighters is significantly less than was a couple of years ago. But when I look at violent extremism, I, I, uh, I, I've heard it called, and I, I wouldn't take issue with this, that it's a generational challenge. And, uh, and until or unless the underlying conditions that feed extremism are addressed, we're going to still see terrorism. And, uh, and our strategy is to ensure that we have a sustainable approach to what is really a trans-regional threat, you know, certainly in the homeland, in Europe, from West Africa to Southeast Asia. It's a trans-regional threat. Um, is to make sure uh, that we have an approach that allows us to have a sus sustain an effort against them to do exactly what you what you suggested is to keep them from uh, doing what they did in 2014 and 2015. Um, from a strategic approach, we we see there's three things that make these groups transregional. Uh, one is the floor of foreign fighters. The other is the resources they have, and the third is the ideology. And our job is to make sure that we cut, if that's connective tissue, if you will, we're trying to make sure that the groups in West Africa aren't connected to the groups in East Africa, aren't connected to the groups in the Middle East and the groups in, uh, in Southeast Asia. 
What that takes is a broad network of like-minded nations to have intelligence and information sharing and where appropriate collective action uh, against those enabling capabilities. And the other thing it takes is enhancing the capacity of local forces to deal with the challenge on their own. And those are really the two things we're doing. That's what, uh, that's what our strategy is, is enhancing this network of allies and partners uh, to, uh, to deal with the problem trans-regionally so we can see the challenge and, 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 and mitigate the risks of it being a trans-regional challenge and then helping develop the capacity of local forces. So if you look at the array of, of threats we've been talking about, you, you can imagine that the PACOM commander, the military commander for um, Indo-Pacific area, is saying, we need more resources here. And you can imagine the NATO commander saying, we need more resources here. CENTCOM might be saying, we need more re resources here. Talk about your role in assessing which one of those guys uh, gets the resources. Sure. I mean, that is uh, one of the more important tasks we face is to prioritize and allocate resources in accordance with the strategy. And as you suggest, uh, if, you, if you look at what the combatant commanders would identify as their requirements, our inventory falls short of meeting all of what the combatant commanders would want to have. So the art for us is to have enough of our forces forward to demonstrate commitment, assure our allies, to demonstrate uh, the ability to respond, which enhances deterrence, and then have the inherent flexibility uh, in the force to get the right amount of forces in the right place at the right time in events that deterrence fails. And that's, that's the art of what we call global force management, but it's the art of really prioritizing and allocating our resources against the strategy. Is, is that what is meant by the term best military advice, which is uh, a phrase that has become more prominent in recent years, particularly under your chairmanship? I uh, have not used that term uh, for probably in about 24 months because for whatever reason, the word best created difficulty for people. I've read the articles for the life of me. I can't understand it. And so I just say military advice. And yes, that is what's meant by military advice. Yes, I've been out there for the last 24 months saying this is a terrible term. We can't be. Yeah, you haven't it. heard me say it for 24 months. <laughs> So, well, part of the, the challenge there is determining is the military advice that comes from HACOM uh, better than the military advice that comes to CENTCOM. That's your job as the principal military advisor. But now I want to shift you into uh, the civil military context because you are s serving as chairman in, an, in a very unusual time where your immediate boss is also a retired four-star uh, Marine and he works for the president who has as a chief of staff another distinguished f retired four-star Marine. So there's three senior military experts all speaking to the president. How does the best, how, how does military advice flow in that kind of environment? Yeah, I, to be honest with you, uh, each one of us has a lane and we work that lane. The secretary, although he is a retired four-star, is responsible for policy. And, uh, and so when we're providing advice uh, to the president, the secretary will generally uh, provide an overview and a brief of the, of the policy implications for whatever it is that we're discussing at, the, at a given time. And then he'll turn to me and he'll say, and now the chairman will talk about the military factors and I'll talk about the, the military factors. Having said that, uh, as you're probably aware, and there are several people that have participated in the national security decision-making process, the national security decision-making process reflects the individual who makes decisions, the president. And so the president can get advice from whoever he wants to get advice from in whatever venue he wants to get it from, and, uh, and he'll do that. At the end of the day, uh, you know, and my predecessor, Marty Dempsey, had a great expression when we were doing our turnover. He said, uh, he said Joe, you need to remember something. He said, you have a responsibility to provide advice Nobody has a responsibility to take it, at least a, a legal responsibility. I have a statutory responsibility provided, but everybody else, you know, based on professional ethic maybe, but not, uh, not in law do they have a responsibility to take it. But I, I, have, uh, I have not found that to be uh, as much of a challenge as people might think it would be. First of all, I think the Chief of Staff in the White House is quite busy being the Chief of Staff of the White House, and, and, and I, haven't found, uh, I haven't found him uh, providing what I would characterize as, as military advice on, uh, on most of the major issues we discuss. And again, the Secretary and I, uh, I think, have established over the course of two years uh, a pretty good division of labor in terms of how we approach the president on some of these issues. For a while there, you also had a national security advisor who was uh, an active duty, but three-star. 
general. And a number of us wondered whether that would be, create a special kind of problem for H.R. McMaster, who was subordinate to the, to you, the chairman in rank, but was also responsible for coordinating the activities of an organization for which you were the advisor. So was that a problem, or were those of us on outside it, it, needlessly worrying? Sure. It, you know, you'd have to ask H.R. Uh, we will. He's yeah. coming in the spring. So if, we'll if it was him. a problem for, for him. Uh, I, I would tell you what I'd like to think he'd say about uh, those of us in uniform. Because uh, when he came into the job, I got the joint staff together, uh, all of our leadership, and I said, look, we have one, one thing that we have to do with the National Security Advisor, and that's to enable him to be successful. And whatever he asks us to do, uh, we're going to do it. Whatever the information he needs to help uh, do his job, we're going to provide that information to him. And, uh, and he's, he has the responsibility to harmonize the, uh, the interagency, and we're going to be team players with regard to HR. He's got a tough job but under any circumstances, not because he's a three-star. They have a tough job under any circumstances, and our job is to make him successful, and that was our, that was our approach. And, I, and I, think, I think you can ask HR that explicit question, and I think he would tell you that that's what he got from the joint staff. So another concern people had about it is uh, you can have too much of a good thing. So one Marine is great, two Marines better, but three Marines, uh, that might be a lot of Marine around the, the table. What about an Air Force perspective? What about a Navy perspective? So there was some concern about inner service rivalry and perspectives. Has that been an issue? I, I don't believe so. I mean, first of all, uh, what you don't see is there's a number of other people retired uh, from all the services, Air Force and Navy included, that are in various places inside inside the administration. I, I think you bring up a broader point, and that is uh, diversity of thought in the inner, in the uh, in their in their in, inner agency. And uh, and and that you know could be a concern if you have too many people that come out of problem from the same perspective, but there is some fairly strong personalities uh, that have been in the National Security Council that come from different places. Uh, a lot come from industry, some come from a, a long career in the Foreign Service and so forth. So, I'm satisfied that uh, that the other views uh, are heard and and we seek that diversity of thought when we're when we're having a meeting. But uh, you know when you in, identify those individuals, you have to keep in mind that they're not all sitting there as members of the National Security Council, and they're not all participating uh, in the dialogue that's taking place when providing advice to the President. So uh, you mentioned General Dempsey again. When he described his role, he said he was the Dash in Civ-Mill or Paul-Mill. Uh, and when I've heard you describe your role, you say, I'm the Mill in Paul-Mill or Civ-Mill. Is is that a distinction without a difference, or is there something uh, important you want to signal with that? Yeah, no, I, I, I actually don't disagree with the way he put it. I mean, I think my job uh, is uh, to listen carefully uh, to what are the political objectives in any given endeavor, uh, to identify the military dimension of that particular problem, and then to provide advice on how the military dimension can best contribute to the to policy objectives that are identified. And so to the extent that he said he was the dash, uh, because of our responsibility in sitting in the National Security Council, we deal with the combatant commanders, we deal with the service chiefs, our subordinate leaders and staffs, and we bring to the uh, National Security Council the products they produce, the thinking that they produce with our own, obvious ju obviously, judgment, uh, prioritizing how and when we bring that into the president. But I don't. I, I do think that uh, I, I play a unique role in uh, in interfacing between our elected political leadership and those of us in uniform. So I, I think the way he characterized it is fair. It's just. It's just. Uh, I think it's more a difference in expression than it is in fact. Not every chairman gets to do what you've done, which is to serve two different presidents. Uh, but I believe you're probably the chairman who served the two most different presidents that that our system has produced. President Obama, President Trump, very different in style, very different in orientation. Uh, what can you tell us about that experience? Is there an anecdote that revealed or made you realize, oh, I'm in a new administration now? First of all, as, as Americans, we ought to be proud of something, uh, and that is the fact that I was appointed by uh, President Obama, and I was reappointed by President Trump. And the issue of what political party that I might have been in or what my political persuasion was never came up, and it shouldn't have come up. And, uh, and I think that's an important point. 
And, uh, and with regard to the two presidents, again, uh, what I said earlier was that the national security decision-making process and those of us participating, participating in that process must support the individual that's making decisions. So how they receive information is different. Uh, how they make decisions is different. Uh, their outreach uh, you know, to other advisors outside the National Security Council may, may be different. Um, the questions they ask may be different. Uh, but my job is to adjust and support whoever the president happens to be, and that's that's what we've done. Let me broaden the aperture now to look at the military's relationship to society at large. Um, do you worry that the public has too high a regard for the military or doesn't understand the military well enough? This is sometimes referred to as the gap issue, 1% and 99%. So many Americans having no personal connection to the military – and uh, and then a, a smaller force that's being utilized quite extensively and deployed quite extensively. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I do uh, have concerns that, that 99 percent of the American people will not have served and maybe not fully understand it. Uh, that that should be a challenge that we take on board in uniform, and I've talked to our senior leadership about this, and that is all makes it all the more important that we do outreach, that we're out there making sure that the American people know what we do and know why we do it. I mean, there's kind of a contract here that is – uh, the American people in the form of the Congress give us the resources we need to do the job. Uh, the Congress has responsibility under Article Two of the Constitution to provide oversight, and so we, you know, for if, in a very meaningful and real way, uh, we work for the American people, and we're conscious of that. And we think the American people ought to understand us. They ought to know what we're doing. They ought to know why we're doing it, and they ought to have confidence that the expectations they have on us are being met. But as as you probably know, Secretary Mattis, before he um, came secretary, wrote a book with Corey Shockey where he looked at public attitudes towards uh, the military. And one of the things in that book that was revealed is over just the last 20 years, the percentage of public will say they just don't know when you ask them questions about the military has gone up significantly. And is this this perhaps reveals that the, the American public is losing some of its connection to the military that they had when their parents had, were part of the greatest generation or they themselves faced the draft. Are, are we in a different environment of the military's relationship to society? We, we are in a different environment. But again, I, I, I view that as a challenge for us that we need to take on board. As you pointed out, uh, you know, post-World War II, everybody had a family member or somebody they knew that was in the military. And so that was their understanding of the military. That was their connection to the military. That's less and less likely today, which makes it all the more incumbent on us to reach out and make sure that the American people know us. And we do that in a, in a variety right of ways. I think what concerns me more than the 99 and 1% is the fact that 75% of young Americans, 75% of young Americans don't meet the physical and mental qualifications for service. That actually is a bigger concern of mine than the 99%. I can do something about the first issue, which is double down on our ability to communicate outreach and make sure the American people know us. And, we, and again, we have a, a variety of ways I can talk about to, to do that. But the propensity to enlist and then the physical and mental psychological aptitude uh, to serve uh, is of great concern. So this is going to be my last question. If you want to ask a question, there are microphones in the back there I can see. And, and please get in line and I'll call on you as we have time. Tomorrow's an election day. And of course, the uh, military uh, have the right to vote and do vote, uh, but they also have a responsibility to stay out of the political process and not be seen as a partisan actor. This is something you've spoken to powerfully during presidential election years. So tell us why you feel that that is so important and, and what is the message you give to the, the active duty force in campaign seasons? Yeah, I mean, the, the good news for me is that uh, over the last two years, we, we believe it's part of our ethos, it's part of our responsibility to be apolitical. And in fact, uh, I, would, I would argue that the U.S. military has been that. There have been some exceptions, particularly by senior officers, which have disappointed us. But by and large, we've been apolitical. The message I delivered during the uh, presidential campaign is very similar to the message I've delivered this time, which is to remain uh, apolitical. Don't be partisan. Uh, the American people have high regard for us. You mentioned that earlier. Uh, in most Gallup polling, 70 to 80 percent of the American people have trust and confidence in the United States military as an institution. 
And I think one of the reasons and probably the foundational reason for that trust and confidence is because we are viewed uh, as a political nonpartisan. And, uh, and I think it's very important that we stay that way. Okay, so let's take this question here. Yeah, General, thank you so much for coming, and uh, I enjoyed your your talk. Um, there's been a lot of hand wringing over development of missile capabilities, as there should be. Um, but in reality, if a, a nation has a, a nuclear device, they could easily put it in in a hold of a ship and float it into New York Harbor. How does that play into military thinking? How how do we prevent that? Oh, I mean, you bring up a good point. I mean, much discussed as a missile threat, but when we look at weapons of mass destruction, uh, and whether it be by state actors or uh, extremists, we have detailed plans and a, and a very aggressive intelligence effort to help us stay on top of that. So we, we spend as much time thinking about that problem as we do the missile threat. Uh, the missile threat is one that uh, gets more visibility, and frankly, uh, it costs more, and it requires more investment, and so that's why it's, it's more visible. But the other, the other uh, challenges associated with me weapons of mass destruction are equally a part of our planning effort and, more importantly, of our intelligence effort. We have here. General Dunford, uh, Jeff Bennis from the Marine Corps League. Uh, are you pleased with the uh, VA's management of uh, veterans' needs? Hey, Jeff, uh, that's uh, one, it's good to see you, Lieutenant from Camp Pendle in 1977. So he's a plant in the crowd, I can see. I didn't know he was going to be here. Uh, Jeff, I, I'm not going to comment on the, on, the, uh, on the VA. I would just say this. Um, I'm not complacent at all about how we take care of our veterans, and I believe that I have a responsibility to advocate on their behalf and do both in individual cases as well uh, as, as a group. And, uh, and I am very confident that, uh, that Secretary Wilkie, who I know personally, uh, has been very aggressive in his first six or eight months to make sure that those gaps that have been identified and taking care of our veterans have been addressed, and, and I'll continue to be an advocate for him. Right here. Yes, sir. Thank you for uh, coming out and speaking to us. Um, you touched a little bit on the, the two plus three that we're looking at right now. 15 years ago, of course, it was VEOs, and 15 years before that was the USSR. Uh, when you look forward, say, 15 years, is there anything on the periphery that you're kind of like sort of on the, the edge of your vision that you're seeing as a potential next security challenge in the long-term future? Sure. When I, well, first, when I look at the two plus three, um, I don't mean to lump them all together, and the professor correctly identified that there are very big differences between them. But when I look at China, for example, if you look at demographics and you look at economics, their, their ability to continue the path that they're on right now is much more sustainable. And, uh, and, the, and what they have done in terms of growing military capabilities over the last few years, I would expect they're going to continue to do that. And when I look out at 2025 or 2035, the benchmark against which we assess our ability to do our job in 2025 or 2035 is much more the path of capability development that China is on than perhaps Russia, which for the same reason is unlikely to be able to sustain what they're doing right now. It comes down to demographics and economics, and I don't think Russia will pose as significant a, a threat in 2025 or 2035 as China. But if you, if you would look at the nation that will have military capability and perhaps inconsistent uh, approach to the world from, from the view that we have, I think you'd have to look at China for the next 20 years, 30 years, as being the, as being the pacing threat, if you will. Here. Good evening, sir. Uh, first, I'd like to say hello to you from one of your former uh, Marines, Mitch uh, Mitchell, and uh, your speech is as formative as he said it would be. Uh, thing that I find missing in the news and all kinds of discussions since everything started in 1992 is talk about CETO. We always hear about NATO and other organizations. Is CETO still a functioning treaty? And where does it stand? Southeast in Asia. Yeah. No, no. Uh, you know, um, for, this is, that's a great question because for all the criticism of NATO, uh, I routinely say, I wish we had NATO in fill-in-the-blank. 
uh, Middle East, Asia. There is nothing, nothing uh, that approximates NATO, an alliance with what we call Article 5, collective defense. Uh, there is nothing like NATO anyplace else in the world. In Southeast Asia, ASEAN is the political organization, and there is meetings at the defense ministerial level, and we have meetings at the chief of defense level. But there is not, I referred to earlier, uh, an organization that is committed to a coherent collective response in terms of defense. And so, uh, no, there isn't another organization like NATO out there. The other treaties that we have and the other organizations are all bilateral. For example, we have a bilateral treaty in the Pacific with Korea. We have one with the Philippines. We have one with Australia. We have one with Thailand. We have one with South Korea. Those are the only treaty alliances, the only formal structures that we have in the Pacific. Here. General, my name is Sid Chopra. I'm a volunteer with the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, which is under NIST. We have a problem, as we've been told over and over again by uh, various experts, including uh, General Nakasome, Nakasone, that cyber criminals are attacking softer targets now. They're targeting hospitals, they're targeting school systems, infrastructure, utilities. This puts the public basically on the front lines of a trillion dollar war that's expected to grow. I've worked with cognitive psychologists, and neuroscientists, and behavior experts how do we on how ways to change the cyber hygiene of the public. You've been at this longer than any of us. What suggestions do you have that we can help prepare the public for fighting in this war? Yeah, first of all, uh, let me talk about uh, the Department, Department of Defense uh, cyber capabilities and how it relates to the problem you just spoke about. You know, there was a time when the Department of Defense said, look, uh, our responsibility is just to defend our own information technology enterprise. So we, we defend and then we play uh, what we call the away game. In other words, to the extent that we conduct offensive cyber capabilities, we do those things outside the United States, uh, largely in the context of a war. Uh, both the Secretary and I feel very, very strongly that right now, uh, certainly in our nation, one of the most, if not the most capable organizations in cyberspace is the United States Cyber Command. And so the public partner, public uh, private partnership between Cybercom, Homeland Security, and the and the uh, the organizations you spoke about, whether it be uh, local government, whether it be hospitals, whether it be transportation networks, and so forth, is critical. And uh, and we think a big piece of our responsibility is to share information uh, with the public that will enable them to better protect themselves against those threats that you that you just spoke about, and uh, in, in part because of trust, this public private. Uh, partnership, which I think is the foundation uh, of addressing the challenge you just talked about, partly because of trust uh, that get, that has gotten off to a slow start. I think increasingly uh, we are building trust over time where people recognize that, no, what we are really trying to do is uh, is better harden them against the challenges that are there. But I, but I do believe with that, it's not a simple answer, but I do believe that the answer in large part is the public-private pro, public relationships, information sharing, and collaboration against, uh, against threats in real-time sharing of information to address vulnerabilities in real-time. Here. Sir, for, can you hear me? Again. Thank you for coming, sir. Um, my question is going to be related to uh, my perception that we'll be, going, we'll be involved in more unconventional warfare. And my background is I was in Vietnam and Nicaragua and Salvador, uh, into Cambodia doing landmine surgeries, um, Sarajevo, Afghanistan, Iraq, 20 years in Colombia. And I have extensive background in unconventional warfare medicine. In fact, I'm the, one of the senior instructors at our unconventional warfare branch at Fort Bragg. Um, I teach that 25% that we own as military um, that got in. From that 25%, I have that less than one hundredth of a percent of the finest medical people, Marines and Special Forces, and my question is, do you foresee us going into unconventional warfare in the future? Because that's what I'm training my guys heavily to do. Yeah, I mean, we're involved in it now, right? 
and uh, and my expectation is that we'll be involved in it for some time to come. I I, I can't predict as I as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I can't predict what the future will be, but I believe that that needs to be a critical capability set that's that's resident inside the department, and we can't make the mistake that we made in the 1970s when we said we're never going to do that again, and and we lost much of the expertise that uh, that we have relearned here over the past 15 years. So, I guess what I would say to you is that. I'm confident enough that it may happen that I believe we should maintain that core competency inside the Department of Defense to deal with that eventuality. And again, in many cases, those skill sets are ones we're employing in places today. Here. Sir, CW2 Michael Parrott. I'm with the National Defense University as a graduate student here at Fort Bragg. You mentioned our plans need to change to address the strategic landscape during your NDU uh, speech up at Fort McNair. Do you anticipate a reorganization of the joint force away from geographically focused commands to more threat-based, globally focused command structures, which are more agile and adaptive in the near future or uh, mid-future? Sure. Let me let me take on the first part of your question and then come back to the organizational construct. And 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 um, I guess. What I would do is I would characterize the environment that we're in right now. We talked earlier about great power competition. Also, most of the challenges that I described, I would characterize as trans-regional, and I would characterize them as involving all domains, right? So when I say trans-regional, they're going to cut across multiple geographic areas. And very quickly, I'm sensitive to many people have questions. If you look at the Korea threat in 1990, you would have seen a sea air land campaign, and you would have seen us largely be able to contain the crisis to the peninsula. Uh, today, were we to have a conflict with uh, with North Korea, obviously they have missiles that can reach uh, countries throughout the region. They have missiles that can reach the United States. They can deal uh, with us in cyberspace, and they can also attempt anti-space capabilities. So you're, you're right away seeing a different uh, different nature of conflict. In the past, in the 1990s, we had a regional strategy. Our national security strategy was regional, and most conflicts were viewed as ones that could be contained within a region. When we look at China and Russia and, frankly, North Korea and Iran, for that matter, and certainly violent extremism, we see challenges that are unlikely to be contained in any specific geographic region. So our plans, which used to focus on a specific eventuality in a specific geographic area now, have migrated from an operations plan on the Korean Peninsula to a global campaign plan, which would talk about what the entire force would do in the context of a conflict on the peninsula. So the second part of your question, so that's, the, that's when I talk about changing our plans, that's the Reader's Digest version as quick as I could do it uh, in terms of how we've migrated. In terms of our organizational construct, what we call the Unified Command Plan, that is our combatant commanders who have specific geographic responsibilities, we're already today realigning functions. And, uh, and although uh, I'm not going to suggest what the solution will be, I will tell you that over the next five or ten years, uh, we will have a steady state of evolution in the way that we're organized around the world, and you will see significant changes in the Unified Command Plan or the, the way that we're organized geographically around the world. Are you a student? Yeah. Thank goodness. I, the deans were going to take away my parking spot if we didn't get a student. Uh, so you're going to ask the next sure one. And, and I see in the back, in the way back, I think there's a, 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 a woman waiting to ask a question. You get to move to the front. You're the next. Yes. Yes. You're the next over here. Uh, I need to preserve my parking spot. Okay. Yes. There you go. Hi, General. I'm a um, freshman here. And for a lot of us younger kids, Climate change seems to be one of the bigger issues on the horizon. So my question is whether or not the U.S. military has a rooted interest in uh, climate change and climate science um, to bar like countries like Russia from gaining power in their specific regions, and how the U.S. military's interest with that uh, conflict or interact with the current president's uh, stance on those issues. Yeah, when we look at uh, when I look at climate change, uh, it's in a category of sources of conflict around the world and things would have to respond to. So, it can be great devastation requiring humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, which the U.S. military uh, certainly conducts routinely. In fact, I, I can't think of a year since I've been on active duty that we haven't conducted at least one operation in the Pacific. Uh, along those lines uh, due to extreme weather uh, in the Pacific. And then when you look at source of conflict, shortages of water uh, and those kinds of things, those are all source of conflict. So it is very much something that we take into account in our planning as we anticipate when, where, and how we may be engaged in the future and what capabilities we should have. 
Thank you, sir. Um, as a military dependent who lived in Japan until early this year, um, I have firsthand experienced uh, the fear that escalating tensions in the Korean Peninsula have um, put on dependents. Uh, so I want to ask, what are your commitments to the families of active duty service members in the American Pacific in light of those tensions? Yeah, a, a couple of things. Number one is making sure that we have in place the defensive capabilities to deal with the threat. And and you'll recall last year when we, uh, with with a great deal of attention, deployed uh, a, a ballistic missile defense, a, a missile defense system to the Korean Peninsula. And as you're probably aware, since you lived in Japan, we, we have those uh, in Japan, and we also have them in. Uh, we also have them, uh, the Japanese also have them as well. The other thing that, uh, that we do is we watch very carefully indications and warnings of a crisis. And, uh, and I can tell you that particularly when North Korea was doing all the testing, uh, the families on the Korean Peninsula and the families in Japan were probably part of our conversation two, three, or four times a week as we thought about what is the right uh, thing to do, under what conditions would we pull our dependents out, under what conditions would we pull out the broader uh, diplomatic mission in those countries. And so uh, it is something that we uh, pay attention to and, as you suggest, have a responsibility for. Here. Sir. Good evening, General. Um, thank you so much for coming to talk with us tonight. My question regards the military's budget. Now, the military is expected to spend $681 billion in 2019, uh, which represents over 50% of the U.S. discretionary spending and more than the next 10 countries combined. We're all taxpayers in this room. Can you justify to us why we need so much and specifically why we spend so much more on our military than everyone else does. Sure. Uh, first of all, we spend 3% of the gross domestic product and the United States of America can afford survival. So I, I, I take the, the, the statistics that you provided and I just flip one back to you that 3% of gross domestic product, uh, the United States can afford survival and it's, it's the main responsibility we have as a nation is to defend ourselves. Uh, a couple of things. One, it's benchmarks against the challenges we face, and it's also benchmarked against the responsibilities we have a nation, as a nation to be a leader around the world. And, uh, and we could want it to be otherwise. Um, I don't know that there's a lot of candidates to step up and actually lead a response to make sure that we do protect the world order that we've had in place since World War II and has brought a fair degree of prosperity and security to the American people. So uh, that'd be my argument, is that we can afford survival. And uh, in the context of GDP as opposed to discretionary spending, I think it's a fairly sustainable amount. And in, by the way, if you go look that up tonight uh, on the Internet, you'll see that 3 percent is pretty low uh, in terms of historically. I think we're going to have time for just one more from each side. I apologize to those still waiting. Hi, General. So I have a quick question about the Russian militarization of the Arctic in response to climate change. I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and what the U.S.'s strategy for counteracting it is in the coming years as climate change continues to worsen. Okay. Uh, I don't have a strategy to deal with climate change in the Arctic in the U.S. military. What we, what we do Russian see military. is that uh, there will be more... Uh, uh, commerce uh, in the Arctic, and uh, and certainly with regard to what we see out of Russia, uh, more military activity, and we've also seen keen interest in uh, in China, in uh, in using the Arctic uh, as a shortcut to move uh, commercial uh, ships and so forth. So it it could be uh, a potential uh, area where conflict may manifest itself, but I I think that what we would seek to do is make sure that it's accessible and peaceful. Good evening, General. Um, I think cor corruption is one of the most insidious problems that we face in the work that we do in the other countries. Does the military have a, uh, an approach? To, is there any way that we can reduce it so that, because these uh, other factors opposing us will appeal to the people who are being abused? And, and I wondered if the military had any remedies for this. Well, first, uh, I, I wouldn't reject your thesis, and certainly one of the challenges that we've had in Afghanistan in particular over years has been has been corruption, and uh, we've tried a variety of ways to deal with that corruption, uh, and what we've come down to, and this is the thing I think you should know as Americans, we, uh, back in 2012, 2013, started to give money directly to the Afghan government, 
We call that on budget. And there was a theory that if we gave them the money directly, they would learn how to manage that money, develop a budget, and execute a budget. Over time, as a result of corruption, uh, we, we provided less and less of the money to the Afghans on budget and provided most of it off budget, meaning that we would oversee uh, the money that is being spent. And what I can tell you is that of the money that is being spent in support of the Afghan National Defense Security Forces, which is what we're responsible for providing oversight, uh, we have increased the numbers of investigators that are over there. Uh, we've asked our interagency partners to provide us some help in providing oversight. And, uh, and we have an organization uh, in Afghanistan that is directly responsible for uh, executing that money that is being provided for Afghan capability. So um, I don't have a solution to endemic corruption around the world. Uh, and I don't have a solution to the cultural factors that feed that corruption. But what I can tell you is, is being responsible for the execution of U.S. taxpayer dollars in those contingencies. I think we have better ways now of overseeing the execution of those budgets to make sure that that money goes where it's supposed to go. So uh, you said you had time for one more, so we'll take one more. Then I guess that would be here. Uh, thank you so much for coming. So. I know you were mentioning uh, when we were talking about Afghanistan that there was like a generational problem. And I was wondering uh, if you could talk about more of like the long-term problems that you see uh, the U.S. facing in Afghanistan and what, if any, the, anything the U.S. is doing to counteract that. Okay. Um, again, in, in Afghanistan, the, the major challenge we have is to support the Afghans in an Afghan-owned, Afghan-led peace process. That's, that's our objective in Afghanistan. And from a military perspective, what we're trying to do is grow the capacity of the Afghan forces to the point that they can, by and large, defend the country with minimal amount of international support. And today, we're providing far less than we did some years ago. We're still providing significant support. So sustainable Afghan forces, at least for right now, defined as capability, not, not financially sustainable, but from a capability perspective, get their capabilities to the point where they require minimal support, and then support the peace process. What you're really alluding to are the broader developmental challenges that are in Afghanistan. And frankly, uh, what we can help do is set the conditions, that is, if there is a reconciliation process, if there is peace in Afghanistan, then perhaps there can be some hope uh, for economic development. But I'll, I will tell you, I cannot visualize that today based on where we are. I think that, that the international community is going to have to support Afghanistan for some time to come. I don't see them being self-sustaining in the near future. And the conditions for them to be self-sustaining and perhaps even to exploit the natural resources that they have have not yet been set. So you've probably heard it so many times that you may be tired of hearing it, but I hope you will hear it one more time. Thank you for your service to the country, and today, thank you for your service to Duke. Thank you. We're very much in your debt. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.